The Cold War between the US and USSR saw the world come close to complete annihilation on more than one occasion, but no incident took us nearer to nuclear war than in October 1962, when America discovered that the Soviet Union was installing nuclear missiles 90 miles off of the Florida coast in Cuba. That triggered 13 terrifying days of escalating tensions between the two superpowers, as both felt that their strategic interests were under threat and neither could afford to be seen backing down to the other. But in the leadership of both sides, cooler heads did eventually prevail, and Armageddon was avoided by a hair's breadth. So then, in the end, just how bad was the Cuban Missile Crisis? In April 1961, 1,400 American-trained Cuban guerrillas landed on the island and attempted to overthrow the new leader of Cuba, Fidel Castro, who had led their socialist revolution to victory in the late 1950s. Within three days of landing at Bay of Pigs in the northwest of the island, the guerrillas had been completely destroyed by Castro's revolutionary army, in no small part because of a lack of promised American air support. The Bay of Pigs invasion was an international humiliation for the United States, but more importantly, it also pushed Castro's Cuba into the waiting arms of the US's Cold War rival, the Soviet Union, which sent surface-to-air anti-aircraft missiles to Cuba to be used to defend the island should the US get any more ideas about launching an invasion. The American president, John F. Kennedy, knew about and tolerated the presence of Soviet anti-air on the island, though he warned them against sending offensive weapons, nuclear-armed ballistic missiles, to Cuba. But behind the scenes, the Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev, was doing just that. On October 14, 1962, Major Richard Hazer, the pilot of an American U-2 spy plane, took hundreds of pictures of missile sites under construction in Cuba. The next day, upon examining the images, the CIA determined that the Soviets and Cubans were working together to install weapons on the island that would have been capable of delivering a nuclear payload to almost any city in the US. In response, JFK formed EXCOM, the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, which gave him effectively three options. One, they could enter into negotiations with Castro and Khrushchev, but not take any immediate action to prevent the installation of the missiles. Two, the US Navy could blockade Cuba and prevent new Soviet ships from reaching the island, or three, the committee's preferred choice, they could launch a first strike against missile sites across Cuba. JFK went against his advisors, fearing that an attack on Cuba would provoke retaliation against NATO targets in Europe. Instead, he chose to blockade the island, though he called it a quarantine as a blockade would have been seen as an act of war. He also sent a letter to Khrushchev pointing out that no one could win a nuclear exchange and demanding that the missiles be immediately removed from Cuba. Khrushchev protested and insisted that the missiles were intended only for defensive purposes. It should be noted that the US kept nukes of its own in Italy and on the borders of the Soviet Union itself in Turkey. By October 23rd, the American quarantine was in place around Cuba, and the Soviets, for the most part, accepted it. On the surface, anyway. Beneath the waves, it was a different story. Soviet submarines, some of them armed with nuclear warheads, were active across the Caribbean. One of them, the B-59, was unable to contact Moscow for several days due to its depth, and on the 27th of October, an American vessel used practice depth charges, weapons with very little yield, to signal the B-59 to surface and identify itself. But the sub's captain, who had no idea that the charges weren't an attack, feared that war had already broken out, and he and the ship's political officer agreed to fire a nuclear torpedo at the Americans. And they would have done it, if not for the presence on the B-59 of Vasily Arkhipov, the commander of all Soviet submarines in the area, who refused to allow a launch and save the world from thermonuclear war. On the same day, an American plane was shot down over Cuba, and its pilot was killed. But JFK correctly concluded that it was unlikely that Khrushchev had ordered the attack directly. And like Arkhipov, he didn't hit the nuclear button. That evening, JFK's brother, Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, met with the Soviet ambassador and informed him that the Americans intended to secretly remove their missiles from Italy and Turkey. The next day, Khrushchev wrote to Kennedy and informed him that the Soviets would do the same in Cuba. So then, how bad was the Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, over the course of less than two weeks, the world's most powerful countries both came close to starting a nuclear war and ending life as we know it. But in the aftermath of the crisis, relations did cool. In 1963, a hotline was set up between the White House and the Kremlin, allowing for leaders on both sides of the Cold War to communicate with each other nearly instantly. 
1968, the Americans and Soviets signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, preventing them from supplying third parties with the ability to create nuclear weapons. So, it was bad, but it could have been a whole lot worse. Hey look, you made it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our next one. If you want to learn more about the US and the Caribbean, find out why it owns Puerto Rico, or check out a different video on screen now. And, as always, I've been James, and thank you for watching Look Back History.